All right. So we're now recording. I'll do a little brief intro here just um, in case some of you need to see some of this stuff again. But um, my name is Shannon Hicks. I'm the research engineer at the Stroud Center. Um, I'm the uh, designer and developer of the uh, Mayfly data logger board that we use in all of these stations. Um, I'm filling in for Dave Bressler, who is not here today. Um, he's uh, in Michigan at a, a Society for Freshwater Sciences um, conference. So uh, Rachel Johnson is also uh, on the call, and, but she's in the car coming back from field work. So um, if somebody has some questions later on, we'll have a Q&A thing that, um, that Rachel and I will be around to answer some technical questions. Um, but uh, this is our usual meeting that we do on the third Thursday of every month for the Delaware River Basin uh, user group for our stations that have the uh, kind of other people joining. Uh, for people who uh, for have our, our usual Enviro DIY uh, stations, we are recording this. Uh, it works best if you mute yourself so that um, we don't hear any background noise. If you have a question, you can either do the raise hand function uh, or just unmute yourself when it comes time later in the, the call for the Q&A period. Uh, all of the videos that we are showing uh, or that we've recorded like this are available at the Wiki Watershed website um, in the DRWI section. Um, the, it's always the same link. Um, we send out the email. Yeah, let us know if there's other people in your groups that you would like us to send an invite to. Either you can forward it on to them, but we're always um, happy to have other people in your associations that um, to attend these, these calls. Um, so it's, yeah, basically just groups working in the DRWI. That's the website for the DRWI project, which I think most of you have already seen. Uh, we also have some grants that are paid for through the Seesaw Foundation when we provide assistance to groups um, in person. So the goal is just to check in and we're going to kind of give you a little tech update from me later on, but the main feature that we're going to be dealing with today is presentation from Krista and um, our usual facilitators, Dave Bressler, Rachel, Krista, who is the actual person giving the talk today, and uh, me, who is a world-renowned juggler there. Um, uh, also, some people who, uh, it was nice to have Carol on the call today, but Carol Armstrong and George Seeds also help out as our Master Watershed um, Steward facilitators. So, um, and the other lead scientists at Stroud are John Jackson, Matt Earhart, and Dave Arscott, who I think most of you know. Uh, the goal of all of this is to support all the station owners and help you uh, collect your data. And then the secondary goal is to analyze that data set and develop the tools for characterizing and contextualizing your watersheds. Uh, today's agenda. Um, so we've kind of gone through number one. Uh, I'll give a quick Stroud update for number two, and then we'll turn it right over to Krista um, to talk about water temperatures um, and uh, the data and projects she's been working on there. Uh, Stroud Center updates. Um, I believe this slide is, is this from last week, Krista, or is this a new slide that Dave put in? This is the new slide. He updated it because okay. he's got my stuff in there. So okay, great. Um, so we've added some um, the the manual. If you haven't been to it yet, um, we actually we we did a um, an interactive uh, well, it was a hybrid workshop uh, a couple of days online and a day in person that a few of you um, attended. So um, and we mentioned this there, but for some of you who um, hadn't heard in the last month or so. The Enviro DIY manual, which is where you can get instructions on how to build and program your CTD and turbidity data loggers, but also handling the data that comes off of them and all the information that we have is now uh, has been updated to us. It's mostly the same content, but we've updated the content to make it more match more of what we're doing. And we've changed the format and the look of how you get to it. It used to be like a, a PDF that you would scroll through or a, more like a Word document thing, but we've now changed it to a thing called as a knowledge-based system. And it is, it's accessible in the same way where you go to envirodiy.org 
and you click on that Mayfly link and you get the options of things of, um, of uh, getting started hardware software forum or the bottom link is the monitoring station manual and appendices. And there's some other links like on the main page to get you there. But um, the, the link that takes you there now looks a little bit different. Um, what's the next slide, Krista? Is there something, does he have another picture of, that's kind of the only thing? Oh, there yeah, that's what it is. So if you click on it, it's that's the address of the manual. It doesn't say, you know, manual anymore. Well, it kind of does there in the middle of the screen under help topics. There's the Enviro DIY station manual, and then there's also the manual appendices, which has some of the supporting documentation. But the, those two manuals, the station manual and the manual appendices, are stored in the framework of what we call the knowledge base. And that's just the way that the website um, handles the um, uh, the, 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 the sections of these pages and the help topics, they call them. So if you go there, things are going to look different, but that is the new format of our manual. Um, and it's, it's much easier to uh, go through the different sections. It's, it's the biggest thing is for us, it's easier for us to update them and um, uh, edit them to keep everything up to date. So um, so it's easier on our end, but it's also easier for people. And then there's PDF links that you can actually download uh, the sections or print them out or, or whatever you need to do. So uh, it's a lot more user friendly and all of the date, the data and the information in the knowledge base articles and the manual have been up to date and we continually work on them. If anything changes about hardware or software or recommended ways of doing things, we're constantly tweaking those and updating them and the price list and the part list and all that stuff so that it's uh, up to date and that you're not looking at something from multiple years ago and trying to make it work. So, um, but that's where all that knowledge stuff is. Uh, the new CTD sensor, for those of you who are in the workshop, you guys got some, they, um, that meter group, uh, which makes that the CTD sensor, which is the model number is called the Hydros 21. Uh, we've been using the generation one sensor for a number of years. Uh, we've been talking about it in this, uh, these group calls for a while that they've been trying to release this new model for more than a year. And there was all sorts of um, problems with supply chains and components and circuits and stuff. And they finally were able to release them and ship them out uh, at the very end of April, first part of May. So all of our workshop users got these, and um, I think a few of them have been deployed. If not, they'll be going out very soon. So the, we are some of the first people in the country to get these this model of the sensor. Electrically, it's mostly the same, but there's a few things. But the bigger uh, difference is that from the bottom of the sensor, the photo on the right shows that when you're looking straight up from the bottom, you actually see the screws that are used in the conductivity measurements and the pressure transducer is kind of built up inside the, the body of the housing. So theoretically it won't foul as often and it will be easier to clean and um, won't break as much. So because it's brand new and it's a new design and all of that, we're just as new to this as everyone else. So it's gonna be kind of a trial and error period here in the next few months as we see how they're holding up in the environment and we can give people updates on cleaning methods or any other things that we think are um, are necessary to explain to people about how things are working. But um, just be aware if you buy a new sensor from a CTD sensor from Meter Group, it's going to look like this when you get it and you'll be wondering why does this thing look different? And this they call it the Generation 2 or Gen 2 uh, sensor. So if you see anything about that in uh, emails or your order forms or whatever, that's the new Gen 2 sensor. The price is about the same. I think it's $490 instead of $475 or something, but it's essentially about the same cost. Um, but uh, they have officially been released as of about a month ago. So that's the sensor you'll get now. Um, we are still selling the Mayfly version 1.1, which is the newest version of the Mayfly. You can buy it on our shop or on Amazon. Uh, quantities are getting a tiny bit low right now, but we're getting ready to restock it with a shipment that just came in. So as soon as I process those and turn them around, we'll have more of those available. We also have the new LTE cell board that we've been using for probably eight months now or so um, and have had really good results with. So, um, and we plan to continue making both of those uh, or having both of these versions available for, for quite a while. So um, this is the current 
uh, state of the hardware right now with, with no giant um, hardware changes or configuration changes in the near future. Um, if you need help with your station, we still really recommend that you go to this website at wikiwatershed.org slash DRWI and fill in the Google form questionnaire there where it's a service request form so that if you need some help, it's way easier for us to troubleshoot your problem if you've gone through the questions that we ask you on the request form instead of just sending a, a one-line email saying, my stuff's broken, what's wrong with it? Because then we have to look up your information and then we have to send lots of emails back and forth asking, did you try this? Did you try this? And all that kind of stuff. And so it's, it's much easier if you've gone through the request form to ask for help um, so that we can streamline that because we we have hundreds of our own stations we've put out, but we also uh, support another 100 or 200 or 300 stations of other people who have bought them and deployed them that are not even associated with DRWI. So it's just a, me and Rachel basically doing um, a lot of the tech support responses. And uh, the more you can help us out by providing information when you're asking for help, the quicker and easier we're going to be at being able to get back to answer your questions. Uh, all the helpful other resources um, are on the wikiwatershed.org website, including links to manuals and data sheets and training material and these videos and all sorts of other stuff. So be sure to check out those if you need it. Any quick questions just about administrative type things, not, not in in-depth technical questions or hardware questions or anything like that. But do we have anything super quick related to the things we just mentioned before we turn it over to Krista? I'm gonna take that as a no, all right. All right. So there we go, we're gonna hand it over to Krista who's going to talk about so the temperature monitoring that she's been doing. And then when she's done, uh, we'll open it up to questions about her topic, and then we'll open it up to wider questions about other stuff uh, in general. But yeah, take it away, Krista. All right. So what I'm going to talk about today is, you know, we have a lot of these meetings about, you know, what your data looks like, um, how to read your data, what's going on on Monitor My Watershed, troubleshooting, hardware issues, right? So, but what about the other end of this, right? Talking about now that you have all this data, you know, what to do with it, communicating that data in a way uh, that can be effective. So just a tiny bit of background, uh, you know, I'm from the Muskinetcong Watershed Association. I'm the water quality program coordinator there. Um, you know, we're a nonprofit uh, up in the northwest corner of New Jersey. Um, and how we accomplish our goals and our mission is through advocacy, protection, and I put protection twice, look at that and policy, um, education and outreach, recreation, uh, restoration, and water quality monitoring. Um, just to give you a background on the river quickly um, and its designations, it is actually classified as a wild and scenic river. Um, it's a partnership river, which means that um, it's not like Utah where the entire state is a park and the National Park Service can own the entire river and manage it you know, in a densely populated state like New Jersey, uh, it's a partnership in who owns and manages the river. That's through the Musconet Kong River Management Council, the state, the county, county managers, uh, the community, local environmental commissions, and the Watershed Association. It's a 42 mile river going from east to west down into the Delaware. So we are part of the Delaware River Basin. Um, and we have three segments that are considered wild and scenic, which uh, less than 1% of all rivers in the United States are classified as wild and scenic. So we try very hard to protect and preserve uh, this designation. And one of the ways that we do that is through our water quality monitoring. We monitor for nutrients, TSS and turbidity, the conductivity and chloride, macroinvertebrates, habitat, uh, bacteria through E. coli monitoring with microbial source tracking, harmful algal blooms in our recreational lakes. Uh, we do fish population work through electroshocking, and we're going to start using eDNA this year. And then, of course, temperature. Um, so one of the reasons that we track temperature is to kind of quantify our restoration uh, efforts, right? 
you want to make sure that some of the buffers that you just put in the dam you took out uh, in stream habitat restorations that you have implemented are working right you want to track some of those best management practices and restoration efforts. We also would like to help identify groundwater sources for protection and restoration. You know, with all the impervious surface around, you get a lot of hot water coming into the system, but what's really keeping it cool is those groundwater sources. Um, and then also the Muskinet Kong is pretty unique in that it has two independently ma managed headwater lakes, Lake Apakong and Lake Muskinet Kong. And Lake Hapakong, being the largest state in New Jersey, has a ton of recreation on it. Um, so the water levels vary on, you know, based on economic values, not necessarily always environmental values, right? They want to keep the water in there as long as possible so that people can drive their big expensive boats around. Uh, then Lake Muskinekong is a pretty shallow lake. So, you know, we get a lot of temperature rise in those first two areas of our headwaters. And then it's an over the top release dam, which means we're getting that super hot water that's just been baking away in the sun coming into the river. And so that's how the river starts. It's not, not a very good start to, you know, bringing, bringing back things to acceptable levels for the biology that lives in it. And so we have several monitoring stations. We had five on the main stem. One was, uh, the victim of drunk teenagers at the beginning of COVID. And uh, we're set to install two more on the main stem. Those are the ones in gray, one near Hackettstown, and then one a little bit up from the confluence with the, Del the Delaware, um, and then three tributary sites we monitor as well. So one of the things I wanna to talk to you about is monitoring dam removals for temperature. Uh, this is the notching of the Hughesville Dam it was a 15 foot dam that used to be uh, in conjunction with the IPP paper mill uh, there in Warren Glen. Um, somebody just told me the funniest story. Apparently I have an intern whose family member used to work at that paper mill. And he told me, oh yeah, all the time you could tell what kind of paper they were processing because of the color of the river. So, you know, basically their settling ponds uh, didn't work too well and you could just tell what they were dying that day based on the color of the river. So we've come a long way since then. Uh, so we have an Enviro DIY station that was installed after the removal of the dam about 50 foot up uh, from where the impoundment was. And then there's previous data to tell us what the depth and temperature was there previous to the dam coming out. So something to compare it to, right? Um, so this is what it looks like after the, res after the restoration and removal of the dam. And so you can see there's not a ton of canopy cover uh, on the one shoreline, right? It's pretty denuded, uh, you know, lots of herbaceous growth. It was um, seeded with lots of willow stakes, uh, other smaller trees, saplings, and things like that. But it doesn't have a lot of cover yet. Um, so we're tracking, you know, with the Enviro DIY the temperature, conductivity, of course, the depth, and we do turbidity at that station as well. So when we're talking about water temperature, you know, by what standard are we using, right? Are we using what feels good to go swimming in or what's good for the environment and what biological uh, thresholds would we use, right? So the state of New Jersey, I, I know it's a little different, um, just the numbers, the temperatures might be a little different for Pennsylvania. But in the state of New Jersey, we go by what's called either trout production or trout maintenance uh, threshold. So part of the most connect column, uh, is freshwater trout production. And so what that means is there's two criteria limits. Uh, we have a daily maximum of 22 degrees. So that that means that it should not exceed within a day that 22 degrees Celsius or a rolling seven day average of the daily maximum of 19 degrees, so it can't stay high for a long period of time, meaning seven days in this uh, instance. For trout maintenance, the temperatures are a little bit higher. So, you know, the criteria limits there is a daily maximum of 25 degrees or a rolling seven day average of 23. And so when I went to, you know, look at this data, 
I wanted to look at it with that rolling seven day average because a trout can probably seek refuge and live through a spike in temperature, but it's, it's just like us, one hot day isn't gonna kill us. But like with what's going on in India right now, birds are falling from the sky because they're sustained temperatures of you know 130 degrees during the day. Same thing here, right? Those fish have to find refuge. And so if the temperature stays sustained long enough, that's what I'm more worried about than just one spike. So those are the criteria I usually use is that rolling seven day average. And so even though we see that the average temperature here in summer is well below that criteria limit for uh, tra trout maintenance in that area, uh, we could see that there are several sustained periods where it's well above, right? So if there's not any cold water refuges nearby this sensor, or if they're not able uh, to find a spring or a groundwater source, they're definitely in trouble. So prior to that, I looked at the data that Nancy Lawler, my predecessor, had collected with some hobos. Um, and prior to the dam removal, summer averages uh, were 1.4 degrees C higher than the average, and the average depth was even deeper at that point. So, you know, we have a depth now of only 1.75 feet and the average back then was three feet. So almost double the amount of depth, but 1.4 degrees higher. So Keith Fritchie with Trout Unlimited, unfortunately who has moved on and we're waiting, awaiting his replacement, um, came up with this a uh, project that MWA and Trout Unlimited could work on to supplement the continuous sensor stations. Um, he had this idea for what he calls a dip in or a synaptic look at what's going on, not just continually in one spot, but across an entire watershed. So with the aid of some calibrated thermometers and a bunch of volunteers, we were able to get a snapshot of what the water temperatures looked like across the entire watershed within a one hour window in the hottest part of the day, which in water is usually around two to 3 p.m. It's had a couple of hours with that noonday sun to heat up, and that's probably when you're gonna get the, your highest temperatures. Um, so in two months, we did this. We had volunteers fan out across the entire watershed um, you know, go out on a Saturday and once in July and once in August. And so since you have a one hour window, we had volunteers that could hit, you know, three, four sites in a row. Um, some of the parameters for that was that you measured in the middle of the water column, not in direct sunshine or in an eddy, you know, dappled sunlight or something that would be the average kind of sunlight conditions for that stretch of river. Um, and then, you know, record the depth that you took that temperature and the temperature and the air temperature so that you can uh, compare those. And then the we did tributaries and main stem sites. And so we did that on the low pad as well. It worked out so well that we took that model and moved it over to the Lapac Kong Creek. Uh, so this one is from August of 2020 and we created some simple data products but then I'm gonna show you about you know, taking some of all this data you're getting with the long-term data from the Enviro DIYs and supplemental data, and then taking that to be able to communicate what you're finding, right? So this is from the Lopat Concrete. This is something super simple I put together just on Google Maps, right? I just traced the waterway so that you could see it really clearly. They have little fish icons, and you just put a dot on the map where your location is, and then you come up with your threshold, right? So Trout Unlimited obviously has, you know, very good data on what is ideal for trout, what is okay, fair, poor, lethal, but things of that nature, right? So who's your audience going to be for this? You know, when you're coming up with those data products, you want to think about that ahead of time um, and, and what kind of infographics you're going to use, right? So you know, we've had many discussions, Dave Bressler and Joe Hernandez at Lapac Concrete Initiative on the words to use, right? So words can make all the difference, right? If we were to use instead of the word ideal, maybe the word attaining. Attaining means something to somebody who works in water quality, but maybe not to somebody who you're meeting at a farmer's fair and you're trying to talk to about temperature, right? 
everybody understands the word okay, everybody understands the word fair, and then poor and lethal, depending on you know who you're talking to at that point, if you want to try and make the, the message kind of grave at that point, right? Uh, that it could be lethal to fish it above this temperature threshold. And then define the issue, right? So you want to let everybody know, you know, in your infographic, well, what's the problem with this? Yeah, it's warm here and it's cooler here. Okay, great. And then offer solutions. So uh, after Keith Fritchie got all of this data together, this was his first draft of a communication product with that, right? And so this was something he was making for other professionals um, and, you know, inside the environmental community. So this was appropriate for education and people on the inside, right? It's got, it's very data heavy. It's using lots of lingo um, and, you know, shortened abbreviated words like MWAT, right? What does MWAT mean? So that's the median water uh, temperature for the week, right? So um, yeah, median weekly average temperature, right? I actually had to look that up. I did not even know what that one was when he sent this over to me at first, right? So you have to know what your audience knows, right? So I can follow this and understand, you know, what he's talking about here as far as the conditions, uh, you know, talking about cold water refuges, the tributaries, um, talking about infrastructure. You know, this map is excellent, um, showing you all the points in which we took data and then has a really good chart here to explain what those colors mean. But if you weren't talking to somebody on the inside, you would, you're going to want to substitute a lot of those words, and decrease the amount of data and lingo that you're using. This would be more appropriate um, for something like you, like I said, if you go to the Warren County Farmers Fair and you have a booth there, this is a little two page handout uh, that you could hand to most people and they would understand it, right? They would get the message of what you're trying to convey to them. Okay. I see that there's a little scale there, what's ideal for fish, what's potentially lethal. And then on the back of the flyer, it gives some guidance, right? Like, why do, okay, I see that this could be lethal for fish, but what do I do about that? Well, you can measure the water you know, temperature, or you can go to these great Enviro DIY stations that are posted all through the Delaware River Basin and check these water temperatures, right? And then it gives, you know, some information on how they can further help, right? Like support river restoration projects, talks a little bit about climate change, and then it directs them also to the website for more information. And so what I have found, because I'm not a data communication expert by any means, you know, this is something that I've grown into in my position, and I have found that it is just really helpful to constantly ask other people to look at it because you can look at something like this for so long and you get it to your perfect standard and you're like, oh, this looks great. And then you hand it to somebody and go, what do you think this is about? And they have no clue, right? You put all these graphs up there, you think you've explained them just well, you know, like really well, but if you're not really getting your message across, then, you know, you've taken a lot of time for no reason. I use a lot of, I use colleagues at first because they help uh, balance out, you know, my, what I'm going for. They'll help me swap words out. Uh, but then I also like ask for, ask people that have no connection to the environmental world, uh, like my wife. I'll just ask her and say, hey, look at this for me. Tell me what you think this is, right? And I don't give her any guidance whatsoever as to what she's supposed to be looking at, but she tells me back and that's where I know I need to work on things, right? To get that message just right. So I compiled some resources and some programs here. I'll uh, put that link in the chat there. Um, River Network gave a really good presentation on how to format data. So your data comes in in a CSV on that SD card, or if you uh, download it off of Monitor My Watershed. And so it's just in that long format, right? It's in columns where all the data is with headers, right? That's, that's long format. And so they can show you how to format your data in Excel if you're not like really familiar with how to use Excel for optimal use and layout. Um, and then they 
show you how to use a product called Canva that's free online. Um, and so it's, you know, basically um, it's a tool to build infographics and it's really easy to import your data into these infographics and show them in, in several different ways. Um, I find that for simple data communication products, PowerPoint works excellent because you can cut and paste and group and all these functions uh, that work pretty much similarly to Canva, just with less of uh, you know, the design element to it. But there is some versions of PowerPoint that have a designer function that is extremely helpful, especially if you don't really have an eye uh, for graphic design. And you don't have to be a map wizard. You can use Google Maps. People love maps, you know? Uh, I made that simple map and it's effective, right? Using colors and outlines to just, you know, uh, once you've defined those thresholds to put a map together, you can hit it with a screen snap and plug it right into PowerPoint or Canva um, and use it as part of your layout. If you're a little more savvy with maps and uh, ArcGIS, uh, works for you. That's they have free online accounts, so you can have um, all the maps you want in ArcGIS. And then this is something I found super useful: is this clipartmax.com. It's you know sometimes finding the right infographic. You don't want to sit there and make it from scratch, right? You just want to be able to look up the outline of a fish or something like that to enter uh, into your graphic, right? And so clipartmax.com uh, has free clip out clip art, unlimited downloads, um, you know, and without those pesky viruses that a lot of times come with downloading clip art off of the internet, I have seen that be the issue. Um, so I think that's about what I have. Yep. Right. So at that time, does anybody have any questions about that? Yeah, I, um, turbidity, are you, you are measuring that? And, uh, yes. And do you have a lot of problem with the sensors or are you, which one are you using? Well, just for the demonstration today, I was using the CTD uh, temperature function to kind of, you know, display how I'm using sensor data in with supplemental sampling to kind of communicate uh, that data. But yeah, I do use turbidity sensors at most of my stations and I have had issues, but what I can do like uh, Stroud and Shannon have suggested is to just start taking storm data, right? So only really focusing on some of those big storms that you can get in there, clean that sensor before the storm hits, get really good clean data throughout the storm, clean it afterwards um, because once you have a turbidity sensor in there for a little bit, you know what your baseline is. You don't need to constantly keep, keep taking your baseline data. So if you can get a couple of really good storms, I would say for me, it's around five to really understand uh, how things perform during dif different levels of storms. But yeah, I, I do use the turbidity sensors and had to modify how I go about visualizing that data and, and analyzing that data as well. Okay, well, yeah, the reason I ask is that we had a couple stations here on Marsh Creek and the turbidity, it was slow moving water and just it, almost you had to clean it every day. Um, and actually, I developed a, a, a low cost, well, not low cost, a, a sensor that would actually sample the water, put it in sample bottles just using little uh, uh, aquarium pumps. So mm. uh, I'm just wondering. Uh, what the interest is, you know, if there's sufficient interest, I'll uh, uh, I'll get a blog out and do work. But uh, I have interest from Lauren McGrath at uh, Willistown. Mm. Um, nice thing about water samples is you got a you know half a liter of water. You can look at the turbidity. You could get all other, uh, but this would be automatic. So that's something I've developed and. I'd like to do it further with uh, a lot of interest. So, uh, and, and it would replace a turbidity sensor because that you want to measure turbidity with high water flows. Is that correct? Yeah. Or, so I events? try to keep it towards the storms, like just capturing storm flow with the turbidity sensor. Oh, okay. So now that's when you expect to get runoff. The uh, uh, suspended solids will be going up. 
Right. Right. Okay. Uh, Eric, I see you have a question. Thanks, Christopher, for that informative and understandable presentation. <laughs> um, speaking of the turbidity sensor, uh, did 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 that information or any of the other sensor information, depth, conductivity, factor into any of the work that you just uh, described for us? Well, we try, that's why we try to keep uh, the depth that we're taking the temperature pretty steady. Like, uh, even though it's the middle of the water column, we're not advising people to go out in the very middle of the river and get down into the middle of the water column. It's just a couple of feet out, which is usually where your Enviro DIY sensors are going to be submerged, right? You don't usually put them out 10 feet into the river. They're usually only out about, you know, four or five feet maximum into the river. And so, you know, if you can get into the river with your boots and not full on gear, like having waders on, that's about as far out as the Enviro DIY sensors are. And so you keep that temperature pretty, um, you know, same across the board, being that your depth and the uh, width from shore is about the same. All right, Shannon. I think that's. I think we're out on uh, questions here. All right, cool. Thank you, Krista. That was really yep. informative. I enjoyed that. Um, yeah, does anybody have any other questions for Krista or for me or about Enviro DIY in general or the DOWI monitoring efforts? Pretty tame meeting this month. Yeah. Well. <laughs> I think I was, half the people in this uh, on the call here were in our workshop the other day, uh, so they 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 probably overwhelmed with Enviro DIY knowledge from just two weeks ago. So, um, but yeah, if anybody has any other okay. questions, um, yeah, Shane, yeah, go ahead, Jim. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, have you had any luck with the wiper sensors? Weren't you uh, looking at sensors, uh, um, turbidity sensors with windshield wipers on them? Yeah, uh, there is one company that makes them. We've been using them since October um, down in um, a um, the Chop Tank and Pocomoke Rivers down in the Delmarva Peninsula. Um, they've been out since I guess it was yeah early October or so, and uh, because down there there's a lot of barnacles and weird uh, stuff growing in the brackish water. So, um, and that's my technical uh, biological term for it. Weird, weird stuff that's growing on the sensors. I don't even know what it is. Each, it's because everyone's got a slightly different, um, uh, you know, salt content and other things going on that all eight of the stations, when we go to see them, have different things growing on them. One is like little small uh, crusty things. Another one's these weird feathery looking algae stuff. So everyone is slightly different, but they're all... Um, there's a lot of growth happening all over the sensor bodies and everything else, but the window uh, of the turbidity sensor gets wiped by a little rubber wiper every 10 minutes, and it's doing a wonderful job of keeping the sensors clean. The bigger problem there is that the um, that motor that spins around uses a good bit of power, so you have to make sure that your battery in the sun is appropriately, um, that it's a sunny spot and your battery is big enough so that the battery doesn't die. Um, and um, uh, and you have to have a, an adapter, uh, a circuit board adapter that goes between the Mayfly and the sensor because it uses a Modbus protocol, which is not a normal protocol that a Mayfly can do without some sort of chip in between. So that's why on our website we have um, in the shop, we do have a Modbus adapter, but we don't offer it for sale yet because we are trying to... Um, tweak the design a little bit um, using those board, uh, using those new sensors. The problem is that we couldn't buy any for a while. Um, and Chris is going to be actually loaning us one of hers so that we could test it because I deployed all my stations and put them out last October. Then some of the hardware changed and we couldn't buy another one. So I couldn't develop a adapter for it if I didn't have the sensor to test it because all of the eight sensors that we have are deployed in the field. So um, now that we've got a sensor to practice on in the next couple of weeks, I should be able to develop 
um, at least a prototype of this adapter and we will then offer it for sale in the shop and then people will be able to buy it and then buy this wiper turbidity sensor and then they'll be able to um, to deploy those so uh, that that would be probably the recommended route of what we're going to tell people but we're, we're probably at least another month away from being able to to tell people exactly how to do this and what models to buy and exactly what to do but yeah the goal is to to have a, a wiper turbidity option for people to to use here very soon so uh, what's the what's the cost approximately the i believe they were like 700 dollars to purchase them but you also have to pay a 25 percent import tariff fee uh, for getting things from china because they're made in china and you have to buy them directly from the manufacturer in china so overall it probably costs close to 900 or so or 950 dollars to get them in the country by the time they're actually here so um and it's you know eighteen hundred dollars for the best U.S. sourced turbidity sensor, and that one does not have a wiper. So if you are if you've got a lot of money and you really need one now, you can buy the the U.S. one for eighteen hundred, or you can buy this one from China for about nine hundred, and then you'll get the wiper. But again, we can't really recommend either because we're still working on the code to talk to the U.S. based ones, which are the ones made by Campbell Scientific, because our code still doesn't reliably work with them. And the ones from China require the adapter that we haven't finished making yet. So either way, that's why we have not been able to give everyone definitive instructions of here's how to, to make a recommended turbidity station right now. Shannon, two quick questions. Mm -hmm. okay. Did you say they were the Yosemitech sensors were not available for a while? Uh, well, they weren't, yeah, they were not able to sell them due to some COVID issues that were happening okay. in China. So they were not accepting sales and or shipping or we, we've got one that we're trying to send back for repair and they weren't even accepting repairs at the time, but they are open again and accepting orders. So um, zero COVID. Uh, yeah, the other COVID related stuff. But again, there's also so many other hardware related stuff where the, you know, the reason the CTD sensors from meter group got delayed was because the chips that they used in the design got changed like four different times in a year because every time they had a design and tested it, then the chip would be unavailable and then they had to redesign it, which is the same thing we have with the Mayfly. So there's so many moving targets right now with hardware and sources of things that um, I, I honestly don't know uh, the long-term availability of the Yosemite. It's the Y511A. Uh, is the model number of that particular turbidity sensor. They do offer one that is not wipered it's just just a standard sensor it's a little bit cheaper and it's easier to use on your battery but uh but you'd still have to go out and manually clean the window so the uh, reason the reason i ask is i've got five of them already and yeah. they're running normally uh and have been for a while i just have to get them out there i just wonder then if i order them again it's still going to be the same uh arduino code going into them that was my qu second question uh, theoretically, yeah, we haven't made any changes to the code. If you're using the, the sample that we gave, uh, it, it just uses standard Modbus commands of taking a sensor and the, the address of the sensor you set um, when you first get it. And so, yeah, nothing has really changed there. Um, what we're just trying to do is, did we did we give you some or you did you buy some of those Modbus adapters from us? Is that how you're using them? I made them. No, okay. I, I, I made the one that Anthony and the rest of you guys have done. Right, so, so Neil well. and Anthony developed one that that also works. Um, it uses the same sort of idea that we use with ours, um, except ours um, uses some of the features of the new Mayfly board. So it was a little bit smaller and easier to produce. But what we're trying to do is, um, it all comes down to the motor of the, the wiper, draws an awful lot of power when it first comes on. So that's a little bit much for the Mayfly to be able to handle that initial surge of power. So what I'm working on designing is the new Modbus adapter that's got its own uh, power supply on it for powering the, okay. the motor. So that way, people who have an older Mayfly, like the 0 0.5 Mayfly, you'd be able to use this because it's a 12 volt motor and the old Mayflies didn't make 12 volts. So my goal is to make a beefier Modbus adapter that is great for everyone who has a current Mayfly, but also people with old Mayflies and everything else. And then uh, also be able to handle multiple sensors because one of the problems is if you've got multiple sensors, you may not want to turn them all on at the same time. So having some cascading um, relays and other things in there to, to time how you turn them on, it, it would be important. So 
once we get those um, designs tweaked, then we'll um, we'll be able to release that very soon, hopefully. So perfect. I've yep. I've got five of these that are going out as soon as I, I can get away from my desk. Yeah, so, that's great. Yeah, the eight you. that we've got in um, in Delaware or in Maryland are working great. The one issue that we are seeing is that the it's a rubber wiper basically that on a little arm. I think you've seen it. It's on there. And what we're finding is after about six to eight months that the rubber on the wiper is starting to get kind of brittle, especially when there's crusty things growing on the sensor and it's <laughs> breaking off or kind of bending or just like totally falling apart. So um, they do sell replacement rubber wipers. I think they're five or $10 each, but shipping for just for those um, from China is really expensive. So if you're placing another order get for spares. sensors in the future with them, I would recommend buying at least one or two wipers for each sensor per year. So maybe if you think this will be your only order this year, make sure you've got one or two wipers for each of the sensors you have um, so that if that rubber breaks off in a few months, um, you'll be able to replace it. I would guess that if it's in an area with less abrasive stuff, they'll last longer, but with so much fouling and weird um, critters growing on the sensors in the brackish water, we're seeing that they're breaking down uh, probably faster than they would have in a nice, clean, you know, freshwater stream. It just has some, you know, brown or green algae on it that we typically see around here. But, um, but just a heads up, because we had to pay a lot for shipping to get these, <laughs> an envelope from China with a couple of tiny little wipers in it. But, um, but it is saving, saving us from driving three or four hours and then going to eight different stations on boat docks and, you know, wiping a sensor with a brush and then driving home. So those wipers are super handy and very, very uh, um, uh, cost saving in the long run. So, yeah. Thank you. All right. Any other questions from anybody just about other related topics or? We certainly appreciate everybody being on the call and definitely thanks to Krista for giving an informative presentation today. Uh, I'm gonna also, I just looked up the how much the tariff was and what that makes each sensor for the Yosemitex. It's okay. When all is said and done, it's $967. Yep, that sounds about right. So, yeah. All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording now.